One of the fascinating things about Raku pottery is that it, it causes the student to be able to uh, take the whole process from uh, the very beginning all the way through the firing. And the firing is very uh, fun and exciting but also kind of dangerous. Some of the earliest pots found in Japan are from around 10,000 BC and uh, they're not like the ones I'm showing here but they are <coughs> more cord decorated and uh, the Joman period of uh, Japanese art is, goes way back um, and <coughs> what happened they think was that there was an association between uh, China and uh, Korea and Japan that uh, a lot of the Japanese um, aristocracy started really feeling like the adoption of uh, the Chinese writing system and the introduction of Buddhism and other religious traditions uh, started having a real effect on um, Japanese uh, life and uh, they called it karamono which was a um, phrase that was sort of uh, in general uh, appreciation of the Chinese way of living and um, so out of that after lots of evolution um, samurais uh, in the 12th century began to really uh, take control and uh, kind of changed from uh, an appreciation or a, almost reverence of Chinese uh, philosophy and um, it became much more about Zen Buddhism uh, than uh, the Chinese form of Buddhism. Um, and th their cultural influence um, was really pre prevalent and really caused a lot of things that we now associate with uh, Japanese culture as opposed to Chinese culture uh, like oh, flower arranging and no theater and calligraphy and the tea ceremony. Well, late in the 15th century there was this transformation that happened um, apparently because of a Zen priest and this taste for displaying karamono in the tea ceremony was replaced by a, a taste for things possessing the quality of wabi. And wabi <coughs> uh, is th things evidencing the qualities of austerity and simplicity and showing the effects of time. So these objects were thought to relate more to Japanese than Chinese taste uh, and reflected in the saying by Shuko, uh, a Zen priest, the moon is not pleasing unless partially obscured by a cloud. And that one phrase really has caught my attention through the, the study of uh, Japanese uh, tea ceremony and raku, um, the aspect of austerity and um, simplicity is th the thing that really is probably the most uh, prevalent in raku, um, a, a, an appreciation of the natural, of the accident, of the things that we try to control and yet um, nature has a way to uh, create a, the happy accident. From the tea ceremony we got the evolution of uh, the Raku family that started making uh, very naturalistic forms and the emperor uh, declared uh, 
the Raku family would be the ones that would make the Raku pieces because they understood the Zen philosophy the best. And so around the mid-1500s until present, there's always been a lineage of Raku masters that uh, made the tea ceremony bowls for the emperors. But jumping forward a little bit, um, this is uh, a picture of Shoji Hamada. Um, Hamada was a national living treasure of Japan uh, in the 1940s. Uh, this is a picture of some of his work. Uh, you can see the very beautiful natural way he uh, works with uh, glazes and, and clays. Um, and when this man, uh, Bernard Leach, who was an Englishman, very fascinated with pottery, hand building, and the arts and crafts movement in particular, visited uh, Japan. He met Shoji Hamada. They created a great friendship. And um, Bernard Leach wrote uh, a book uh, that was used sort of as the Bible of pottery students in the uh, 50s and 60s. Um, and it had a chapter on Raku. Now, the, the, the Japanese had a strong uh, sense of uh, uh, t um, the presence of time and how a potter uh, could uh, make a piece that would be show the evidence of time in their work. Uh, this is a piece by um, uh, Bernard Leach, and but the Japanese actually didn't take the pieces out of a kiln and put them into combustibles. It, they just took them out and let the glazes crack, and then the strong tea would uh, stain in between the cracks and give you what we think of as a crackle glaze. Um, but it was the, the, uh, the qualities of relaxation and comfort and putting the glaze on in a very um, not random, but uh, comfortable and easy style that they were so um, happy with. <clears throat> now, it took really uh, a man named um, Paul Solner who created pieces like this in the 60s uh, to be able to bring us forward to what is now thought of as the Americanization of Raku. And uh, Solner taught pottery. He was a student of Peter Volkos. Uh, and he had a, um, a kind of a... <laughs> Uh, he liked to have a lot of parties, <laughs> and he had a party at his house, the story goes, and he would make these tea bowls, and uh, people would glaze them and fire them, and he would pull them out and, and dip them into his swimming pool to be able to get them cool enough that they could drink out of. And uh, the story goes that while he was on the way to the swimming pool uh, one time, he dropped the uh, tea bowl in a group of um, pine needles and the pine needles caught fire and wow it changed the glazes and, and uh, made a little bit of carbon happen and when he dipped it in the water it, it stayed that way. Well this caused him to do a lot of um, experimentation and his work is renowned for its qualities of uh, wabi uh, showing the presence of um, time uh, and the energy that it took uh, to make these and he also uh, really got a natural quality to the clay. Um, now the clays that you use in Raku are very different than other temperature ranges and uh, they are a porous soft uh, clay and um, they 
they remain that way partially because of the extreme thermal shock in uh, taking them out of a uh, 1800 degree kiln into the presence of um, you know whatever the temperature is outside at the time but it's the um, presence of time the uh, unpredictability the uh, casualness the comfortableness with the clay and the uh, surface design that makes Raku either really strong or not. Um, the quality of being hand built, the quality of it being natural, I can't emphasize that enough. And of experimentation, trying different things um, in both the formation of the pieces and the firing of the pieces. Now, I'm going to be showing you uh, different techniques of building, but you know they are just the basics of building. This is uh, this was thrown on a wheel, but it um, obviously uh, has like footprints on the top from a tennis shoe that uh, Silner had uh, when he did a workshop. I saw him. Uh, he made this giant, wonderful, closed form and then threw it on the floor, grabbed a uh, concrete block and threw on it and stepped on it several times with his tennis shoe and uh, his feet and um, then proceeded to put things together like this. And it's the spontaneity and the lack of concern uh, the juxtapositioning of something very smooth with something very rough that really, really makes Raku either make it or, or not make it. In this piece, uh, he uses um, uh, stencils that uh, he put animal crackers down on a newsprint uh, piece and drew around them, cut them out, uh, taped them onto the side, or not tape, um, probably just water, uh, onto the side of a pot, put the slip on over the stencil and then peeled it off. And so where you see the black, it is the raw clay and where the uh, color is, is either an angobe uh, or a slip or a glaze. This was thrown upside down. I mean, it was it, the bottom now it was was the top at one point and uh, the thumb hole in the top is, is uh, uh, kind of a signature of him uh, reopening a, the bottom of the pot. These are slides that I took over time at different art fairs showing different Raku um, techniques um, and some of them I know how to do some of them I don't know how to do they're just exploratory works the whites are almost always a glaze um, but that can't totally be said as true uh, you could the color in this probably came from uh, colored oxides that were put on the bisque ware and then fired um, in the Raku firing. This is a piece that undoubtedly was um, um, had glazes on it and unglazed areas that then took on the, the smoke from the black. In the black areas. These are Sagar fired pieces, which are not Raku, but they're very similar in that they have uh, carbon uh, uh, coloration and uh, oxides on parts of them. This is a raw clay piece that has been bisque fired, and then all of the color that you see on this is copper carbonate oxide brushed on uh, and glaze uh, raku fired 
uh, and when it's been put into the carbon, then it has uh, uh, turned the copper into a red, uh, which is typical of copper going red in a reduction atmosphere uh, versus an oxidation atmosphere. Inside the um, trash can lined with carbonous material that catches fire when you take a pot out of the kiln and put it into there, you have a closed environment or atmosphere where you're restricting the fire from actually um, uh, getting enough oxygen to keep going and so it pulls the chemical oxygen out of the, the, the uh, in this case copper um, carbonate and it changes it uh, chemically and makes it red. If, it, if you don't, it sometimes goes um, different colors, but most of the time it goes green. You know the way a copper penny, if you put it on a battery, will uh, oxidize and go green. That's because it's getting a lot of oxygen during that chemical process, and yet it's copper colored when it's uh, reduced. Many potters try different experiments in um, uh, the clay part of the formation of the clay piece during the, the bisque firing, uh, after the bisque firing, and in the raku firing uh, process. This piece was made and fired in the bisque firing, uh, and then each of the pieces, uh, after being broken, was uh, glazed in a different way, glued back together, and then this red was put on over. It's probably a red uh, paint as opposed to a glaze. This is very similar to some of the um, tall pieces that I expect that you will be making. Um, it's a uh, tube made around another tube and uh, looks like rope at the top that then uh, has been airbrushed uh, and then the rope creates a resist for when it's taken off then it leaves the color of the clay behind. But you can put uh, wire on the clay after it's been bisque fired um, and it will create sometimes uh, a resist uh, from the smoke getting all the way to the, the uh, piece. This is uh, a piece that has been um, oxides only, uh, fired in the uh, raku process, and then after it's out, scrubbed, uh, cleaned up, and then little copper wires have been glued into the little holes that were created during the clay formation period. This piece um, has been made uh, in two parts and then uh, it's been woven together after being raku fired uh, with uh, hair or um, some kind of fiber piece. Here's another piece that was made in parts and then assembled after it was um, out of the kiln. Now these are halos. Um, we are going to try to play around with some borax uh, or soluble materials this time to see if we can get this. It's not easy. Uh, if you see the, the, the gray area on here, this is um, uh, the smoke from the, the combustibles. But then there's also a dark uh, blacker gray and a reddish uh, color on the tall piece there uh, that has a white line around it. Those are halos and um, the, the soluble salts uh, that are put into uh, oxides will sometimes make the salts go to the surface as uh, the mixture dries 
and creates this edge or halo. Uh, very nice piece that is um, oxides and a copper glaze at the bottom, I believe. Some potters are fairly uh, reluctant to share their information with others because, uh, you know, they depend on sales uh, of these. And, but you can see uh, it, the, the green rectangle here, the black tail that, that connects with the white above, and uh, that usually indicates that uh, there was an area that was uh, smoked and uh, yet where it, above it, it was glazed. This is a piece by Donna Paulsena, uh, good friend, uh, and still pro producing great work. She's using halos in the bottom part of this. Uh, and this is a, a, a piece that uh, could be structurally made by you in this class, a segmented uh, slab built piece. Uh, I really love the way she puts together the handles and the edges on the top parts of her piece. Uh, this is a piece by uh, Wayne Higby, who teaches at um, Alfred University in Alfred, uh, New York. Uh, it's a secret box. The top part's a lid that uh, you can take off bottom part is a, a large slab built piece that then has been uh, glazed and in the white areas and not glazed in the black areas. Um, beautiful work. Here's another one of his. He made a series of these bowls that um, have kind of an inside-outside relationship uh, where the, the white glaze starts on the outside and then continues in on the inside. <coughs> Here's another one from that series. And then he did a series of box forms that when you put them close together like this, they um, create these beautiful landscapes. Uh, this is a, uh, an artist that I ran into in one of my uh, markets that I was in. Um, in the 80s, um, magic elements that uh, ha are sitting on a tray full of vermiculite, um, and I just love this idea of several pieces being made that then could fit together. Uh, this piece has a, a actual, uh, after it's been raccoon fired, a uh, piece of copper that was added to the lip on the top and then these uh, glazed X's that I thought were really striking on the base. This is just a very simple plate and uh, it's, it's just white glazed on the outside and um, probably copper on the inside with this just really strong black area that is left unglazed and you can do that when you when you get to the raccoon firing by just putting down uh, wax uh, in the areas that you don't want the glaze to adhere to And then this is some more of Rick Dillingham's pieces. 
um, who intentionally, uh, after the bisque firing, breaks them and then glazes them, uh, sometimes and fires the pieces in different firings, uh, and then puts them back together. Very um, random in some ways way of looking at design, which is uh, I think very effective. Oh, and this is one of my pieces uh, from probably the late 70s. I did a series of Raku totems like this. Um, the middle and top piece was thrown on the wheel. The bottom piece was hand built, and there are um, hand built elements that are the transitions between the three uh, forms. Uh, this is a uh, raku uh, basket that I made around the same time period, maybe early 80s. Um, and it was made over a form, a, a, a pyramid. Uh, and then all of the strap handle and the other parts were then added uh, onto that after it set up a bit. That's a double strapped uh, basket. Um, these are fairly um, bare clay with the, the color coming mainly from the uh, smoke and the combustibles and then white glaze with a little bit uh, of copper oxide here and there. I think this is the last piece in this series. So, um, I hope that helps you get some inspiration. Uh, if you'll watch the technical um, parts of the um, other videos that I've put together, then you'll get a better idea of um, really how to build things. Uh, the, the main thing is to keep your uh, thicknesses uh, even, not too thick or they'll explode, and uh, you can always get more pieces in uh, a raku kiln if they're tall rather than uh, flat. So if you're going to do flat things, then realize you won't probably have time to do as many, and you'll also take up uh, a lot of space on the kiln shelf unless you figure out a way of putting them upright uh, in the kiln. Um, so the process basically is you build your pieces um, and you can build as many as you want. We may not be able to fire them all in the raku firing. Uh, when they're dry, then bring them to me over at the studio and I'll bisque fire them. Uh, if you want, you certainly can put underglazes, uh, colored underglazes, commercial underglazes, you can get those at Ceramic Cottage in Tulsa, and uh, Anne is very uh, wonderful to work with over there. You put those on the clay when they are, when the clay is still wet, or when the clay is uh, dry in the greenware state. Uh, then bring them to me. I'll bisque fire them, and I'll have them ready for uh, the glaze firing and the raku firing. Uh, on the dates that I've given you. Um, <coughs> and then we will uh, pre we will glaze them out there, we'll put oxides on out there uh, the first part of your time, and then we will uh, preheat them on the top of the kiln, and then we will um, put them in the kiln, when the glazes melt, we'll pull them out, uh, and you bring your own combustibles, that you want to experiment with, newspaper, uh, sawdust, uh, shavings, uh, whatever burns, try different things for different effects. You may uh, be surprised about that, you may not. Um, 
and then we will pull them when they are um, the glazes melt we can see in the kiln and, and they'll look shiny and then <coughs> when you uh, get them out then you have to make a decision do you want to uh, blow on them and crackle the glaze um, and then when you put them in the combustibles uh, chamber the post reduction chamber then that smoke will go into the cracks making the cracks black um, and if you don't and you want them to stay out then they many times will crack anyway uh, if you don't put them in combustibles uh, but you'll get different effects from the copper copper usually goes green in um, oxidation or, or lots of oxygen on it and it goes uh, copper colored or blue or yellow or different colors in reduction atmosphere so um, we'll learn more as we go along if you have any questions give me a phone call or text me and I'm happy to answer anything thanks for watching